All right, good. Mm -hmm. uh, so okay. let me just say that uh, welcome uh, to Loon. Uh, you, uh, you know, uh, for everyone else, um, she's an astrophysicist uh, slash article, uh, astroparticle uh, physicist uh, slash instrumentation specialist <laughs> slash uh, calibration person <laughs> slash all sorts of different things. And she's from comes to us from uh, Ankara, uh, Turkey. Uh, and she's working in the space um, in, um, uh, instrumentation space, space slash technologies, uh, yes. technology uh, place that's kind of like what I'm used to with the Indian Space Research Organization or what you might see at uh, uh, Huntsville Marshall, I guess. Uh, anyway, and she'll be talking about uh, supernova remnant classification. Uh, so take it away. Uh, okay, thank today. you very much. Let me share. <clears throat> All right, so here we go. Oh, and just so uh, I think uh, Aneta warned you, right? So you know, you're going to be um, constantly interrupted. Uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she warned me actually. Yes, yes, I'm prepared. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay, let me start now here with my first slide. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for uh, your kind invitation to give this talk today. Uh, in this presentation, I want to talk about learning to sample and classify supernova remnants uh, from data provided by uh, current and future uh, current and future uh, gamma ray observatories. Uh, let me note here that my main research area uh, is data uh, gamma ray data analysis, and I'm not an expert in statistics or machine learning, but I'm in the phase of learning more about these topics. Um, so I will first give a short introduction uh, to supernova remnants and gamma ray astronomy. And then uh, I will talk about source confusion in gamma ray astronomy. And I will mention all methods to resolve source confusion, including machine learning. And finally, I will summarize my recent, uh, recent research plan with you. So uh, radiation from space can be grouped into two uh, main categories. The first one is the particle radiation and the electromagnetic radiation. Uh, the measured particle radiation uh, coming from space is called cosmic rays. Uh, here you see uh, the spectrum. Uh, of cosmic rays spanning up to extremely high energies uh, like uh, 10 to 20 electron volts and the spectrum uh, is in the form of a power law approximately a power law here uh, function with a spectral uh, index of about two and this index shows that the cosmic rays are accelerated uh, to these energies uh, by a proce process uh, which we call a uh, fermi acceleration process <clears throat> Okay, uh, supernova remnants could be the origin of cosmic rays observed on Earth uh, because they emit radiation in a wide range, uh, wide energy range, up to 20 to 50, uh, 10 to 15 electron volts, and they exhibit a power law type uh, spectrum uh, with a uh, with a spectral index of about or around two, and they are located in the Milky Way, meaning uh, they are spending a long time there, and they could uh, in this way continuously eject cosmic rays into the galaxy. Um, he, uh, and gamma rays actually um, are, although they are categorized as electromagnetic radiation, uh, they are also considered as uh, cosmic rays because they are also uh, plenty, uh, they are producing plenty in these astrophysical sources. And these are the main uh, production mechanisms uh, of uh, gamma rays. And the first one is the Bremsstrahlung process uh, that happens when energetic uh, charged particles move in the presence of an electric field. And the other one is the inverse Compton scattering, where uh, the photons uh, of lower energy uh, are upscattered through collisions with high energy particles. And these two um, processes are uh, making up the leptonic processes. And <clears throat> other processes also exist uh, for gamma ray emission uh, production, which are the hadronic processes. And uh, one of them, uh, one of the typical processes here is that uh, this is the neutral pion, and this neutral pion is decaying uh, to two gamma rays after a certain amount of uh, time, and uh, that uh, will be the indication that uh, cosmic rays uh, that exist in the supernova remnant shocks, for example, may interact with matter, and that uh, through that uh, these gamma rays are produced. Uh, there are three types of supernova remnants. Uh, first off is the shell type uh, supernova remnant, where you observe the shell uh, in various wavelengths like radio and X-rays. Uh, the typical uh, shell type supernova remnant is the Cassiopeia A. 
And Crab Nebula uh, is a plerion uh, and pulsar wind uh, nebula uh, where you find the pulsar inside this uh, nebula, which we call the synchrotron nebula in X-rays. It also um, it, it is also observed in other wavelengths like uh, radio, optical, and gamma rays even. And the other third group is the mixed morphology type sup uh, supernova remnant, where you have a, a thermal X-ray emission at the center, but no emission coming from the shell and uh, you have a radio emission coming uh, from the shell. Uh, Multi-wavelength observations of supernova remnants are very useful to better locate and identify gamma ray sources, uh, also to resolve the morphology of extended uh, gamma ray sources, um, and to better separate the gamma ray emission mechanisms uh, from each other, like uh, the leptonic and hadronic uh, emission models, and eventually understand the acceleration and propagation uh, processes uh, of uh, cosmic rays. Starting with this slide, I would like to introduce the existing and upcoming gamma ray observatories. Fermi Gamma Ray uh, Space Telescope was launched in 2008, and uh, it's still operational. It has two detectors on board, Large Area Telescope and Gamma Ray Burst Monitor. Uh, LAT is um, uh, measuring in these energy ranges, uh, in this energy range, which is 20 MeV to 300 GeV, and uh, the burst monitor is uh, measuring uh, between uh, 10 keV and 25 uh, MeV. Uh, the gamma ray source catalogs published by Fermilat are listed here, and um, the most, uh, uh, and the most, or let's say, the most recent one here is the 4FGL uh, source catalog. And in this source catalog, uh, there are uh, 60, about 60 SNRs plus uh, PVN uh, sources. And note that uh, the un uh, associated class uh, of sources, uh, there are about 1,800 unassociated sources waiting to be uh, associated and identified in other wavelengths. Within the first couple of years of Fermilat, observations mainly young and middle-aged uh, supernova remnants were detected. Uh, young uh, SNR show correlation between X-rays and TeV gamma rays, uh, and uh, gamma ray production mechanisms are mainly leptonic. And in the middle-aged uh, SNRs, uh, usually a middle-aged SNR uh, is interacting with the molecular clouds uh, around uh, in its surrounding, and uh, that is uh, leading to hadronic uh, type emission. And uh, here you see, for example, the spectrum of two young uh, supernova remnants, and these here are two middle-aged uh, supernova remnants. Uh, you see that the spectral uh, shape is quite different uh, from supernova to supernova. And in this uh, slide uh, or uh, graph, you see uh, the supernova shock is ex expanding into the interstellar medium. As it does so, it will interact with the molecular clouds. Uh, and some of the cosmic rays escaping from this shock regions uh, might go and hit uh, nearby molecular clouds. And they might uh, cause this molecular cloud to get illuminated in gamma ray uh, emission. This map displays the existing and upcoming gamma ray observatories. And uh, here uh, is the- uh, to, to sure. a yes. question. Uh, so can you say uh, uh, the, the reason for the, uh, for the change in the spectrum is simply because uh, they, um, uh, you know, they, actually, I don't understand why, why would there be a change in the spectrum between the-, uh, as, as the Because they are the uh, actually referring to different um, physical um, gamma ray production mechanisms. So for example, a middle-aged middle, middle -aged, uh, supernova remnants uh, that I just said that they are interacting with the molecular clouds uh, nearby. And so they are actually producing, they are producing uh, these proton-proton interactions that produce uh, pi zero or neutral pions, which are decaying into two pi. And uh, when this particle decays, it will decay around a certain um, a center of uh, mass energy of, of this particle, this pi zero. And that's why you would see a peaking up around this uh, particle's uh, mass, uh, pi zero uh, mass. And so that's why you are seeing always this kind of a shape uh, for the middle uh, middle aged supernova uh, remnants. Of course, if this super middle aged supernova remnant would be um, placed somewhere else, uh, a little bit maybe above the galactic plane where you do not have uh, a, a lot of um, molecular cloud density, let's say, then uh, maybe you would not be able to observe uh, this kind of feature. Or even if there would be such a feature, uh, the luminosity would be so low 
Uh, because um, the luminosity of uh, this uh, peak is uh, directly, uh, or the total luminosity coming from these middle-aged uh, supernova remnants are directly related to the density of the molecular clouds. So when you go a little bit about the galactic plane, even if it is middle-aged, uh, the luminosity would be so low uh, that uh, you would probably not be able to detect this uh, middle-aged supernova remnant. But because these two uh, candidates here, uh, because they are uh, at the galactic plane, where the, the, the density of the molecular clouds is uh, very high. Uh, for that reason, uh, you are able to see them as bright supernova remnants uh, in GV uh, gamma ray energies. <laughs> and uh, if you look here uh, for the younger uh, supernova remnants, the shocks are still uh, very energetic uh, in these uh, supernova remnants. And therefore, uh, mainly you see uh, the leptonic type of uh, interactions, meaning inverse Compton scattering. Inverse Compton scattering is observed mainly in TV gamma ray energies. And so um, that's why uh, th this uh, peak, or it's not a peak, but it's the shape here, uh, or the observation data points are mainly in the region where you can observe this type of uh, gamma rays uh, with ground-based uh, gamma ray observatories uh, rather, than, uh, rather than the space-borne ones. Uh, okay? Yes. Uh, a couple of follow-ups on that. Uh, sure. So, uh, I mean, so does this uh, does does the amount of uh, circumstellar material that might have been uh, pushed off in the late stages of the progenitor star uh, that would also affect um, sure. uh, how 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 much uh, you know how quickly this shape change happens? Right? Yes, yes. There is a certain uh, uh, maximum energy. Uh, 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 of the uh, particles accelerated in these shocks uh, that reach a maximum uh, and the set off phase uh, is actually a uh, time where these particles uh, accelerated may reach a, uh, a maximum energies and uh, this uh, is of course uh, also playing an important role uh, in the production of these uh, gamma rays okay and the other question is so it does depend a great deal on the uh, environment meaning uh, what you see in, in maybe the LMC is going to be very different from what you would see in the galaxy. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? Uh, you mean the large Magellanic cloud? Yeah. Yes, of course. The large Magellanic cloud we also observe in uh, GEV gamma rays, by the way, but uh, in the large Magellanic clouds, uh, uh, the environment is different and uh, we see more star formation uh, maybe happening. Uh, of course, there are also star formation happening uh, still uh, in our galaxy and uh, uh, especially around the galactic plane, as we say. Uh, but um, we are still trying to understand, actually, the gamma ray emission coming from star formation regions. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a different uh, topic, but um, I will show you a slide uh, mm -hmm. in, um, towards the end of this talk uh, that is maybe indicating that you might be able to, you might be seeing actually uh, in Fermi uh, lab data, uh, also gamma rays coming from star formation regions. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me continue. Uh, as I said here, uh, the red uh, colored, um, sorry, let me start with the yellow colored um, uh, names here are the existing um, uh, gamma ray uh, observatories and uh, the red colored ones are showing you the um, upcoming uh, gamma ray observatories. And uh, some of these um, observatories such as HESS and MAGIC and VERITAS, these all are imaging atmospheric uh, sharing of telescopes or imaging air sharing of telescopes. And uh, there is a class here uh, like HAWK and uh, SWGO. Uh, these are water sharing of telescopes. And in this talk, I will only review uh, HESS and CTA uh, because uh, it takes a long time to explain all of them one by one. And so here is uh, HESS. Uh, HESS is built in uh, Africa, in the country Namibia, uh, called Namibia, in Coma Islands. Um, and um, it, it's consisting of uh, five telescopes, and there are four telescopes that have a 12 meters uh, diameter and uh, another one in the middle, uh, which has a, a 28 meters uh, diameter, is a single dish uh, that is actually built to um, reduce the energy uh, here uh, at this uh, point, reduce the energy detected um, uh, gamma ray energies. So the, the larger the dish, uh, the lower the energy energies you can detect in gamma rays and um, so when you comb when you run these all these five telescopes in combination you will be able to uh, reach the lowest energy of about 230 uh, GeV. this here is the sensitivity curve uh, for the uh, 
for the telescopes when they are running combined mode. Um, and usually the sensitivity curves in uh, TV gamma ray astronomy are always given uh, in units of CREP because uh, CREP nebula, because this is the uh, ca standard candle in TV gamma ray astronomy. <clears throat> and this is the Galactic Plane Survey. Um, and uh, this survey yielded actually 16 supernova remnants and 12 uh, PVN. And uh, in addition to that, in, if you combine all TEV catalogs, uh, TEV gamma ray catalogs, the total uh, detected number of supernova remnants and PVN uh, are summing up to uh, 63. And, um, but also <laughs> the unidentified sources uh, are summing to 65. So it's about 50-50. The Sharenkov Telescope Array is, the future, is a future project that's currently under construction. And uh, there are two sites uh, for this uh, ob uh, observatory. Uh, one of them is in Chile, uh, that's the CTA South site. And the other one uh, is in Co uh, uh, Canara Islands, uh, where um, that's also in, in the Northern Hemisphere. So they will have complementary uh, visibility uh, in the sky. Uh, this observatory is expected to detect between 200 and 500 SNRs and PVN. So the number will increase uh, by a factor of 10. Um, future observatories will produce, uh, therefore, large amount of data with good angular resolution. Nevertheless, uh, source confusion is expected to be a challenge still, uh, especially for data collected from the galactic plane, um, where most of the SNRs are uh, located. Um, so we need to build tools to efficiently combine and or compare data uh, obtained at different wave bands in order to uh, recognize and classify supernova remnants uh, as well as to interpret uh, the physical um, mechanisms taking place uh, in these uh, objects. 20 to 25 percent of these galactic plane sources uh, are SNRs and 60 are PVN, but half of them are still half uh, uh, of them are still unidentified. So why are there unidentified gamma ray sources? Um, as we hinted before, uh, there are especially at lower energies, uh, gamma ray sources have uh, multiple uh, multi-wavelength associations, which cannot be disentangled. And the other reason is uh, they appear as extended gamma ray sources uh, and they consist of several still unresolved uh, uh, sources, and uh, they are completely dark sources with no counterparts at any other wavelengths. Uh, this is uh, another reason for that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this source confusion challenge can be mitigated in three ways. Uh, first, uh, new observatories with better angular resolution can be built, but uh, it will take a long time um, to build uh, these observatories. Uh, second, uh, multi-wavelength observations and analysis can help, of course, to resolve the source confusion. But uh, multi-wavelength data is not available for some regions of the sky and um, writing new proposals and getting the observations uh, done takes a long time. And third uh, option is uh, the, uh, the using the machine learning tools um, for the analysis of the data. And uh, the advantage is once they are trained, they can be used to get an initial result whenever fresh data is available. Okay, uh, this slide is actually uh, to show you that if available, uh, multi-wavelength observations are used to mitigate the source confusion. So let me start with this one on the right, uh, right hand side. Uh, this is actually a, a molecular clouds map and on this map, you see uh, two, uh, two black um, ellipses and uh, crosses. Uh, these are uh, GEV sources from Fermilat uh, catalog. And the one on the, middle, uh, on the center here uh, actually uh, was uh, thought to be a part of uh, this supernova remnant here, 3C397. And it was thought that um, this supernova remnant is interacting with the molecular cloud and causing this emission here. But after we made the uh, detailed multi-wavelength data analysis, we figured out that these sources are actually physically not related to each other. And um, I'm coming to the point uh, uh, related to the question is that we searched uh, a counterpart in uh, many multi-wavelength catalogs uh, for this one here, for this detected source. However, the only thing what we could find is that the nearest uh, multi-wavelength counterparts were uh, some star formation regions. 
So uh, there uh, is. A... Excuse me. Sure. Yeah, could you could you uh, tell exactly what's on this map? I just got lost. So because <laughs> oh, <laughs> there is yeah. a lot of information there, right? I so, know. Like, I, the colors I'm sorry. And cultures. Okay. I'm sorry to squeeze everything in here, but I no. wanted to mention everything. <laughs> so no, yeah, I'm no, it's good. It's everything just, uh, out. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Okay, let me explain to you. Uh, this map, first of all, is a longitude latitude uh, map uh, of um, the molecular cloud emission. Um, and uh, this molecular cloud, um, actually in the paper, there is a, another uh, velocity range uh, for this molecular cloud. This is in a, taken in a certain velocity range. Um, and uh, so we actually put uh, the um, contours, the GEV gamma ray contours on top of this uh, CO map, okay? Um, and when we put it on top of the CO map, uh, we see that uh, the center of this um, emission is uh, uh, right over here, uh, centered over here. Uh, before we analyze this GB data though, we had to take uh, the pulsar, this is actually a non-pulsar, we had to take the pulsation effects away uh, from the analysis uh, in order to be able to detect this uh, source in the center over here. We couldn't detect any emission uh, that is related to this supernova remnant. So um, this cloud, especially uh, with, in this velocity range, was giving a um, distance of 2.6 kiloparsecs uh, with a certain density of, of about 330 uh, centimet uh, per centimeter cube. So um, uh, this cloud is not directly related to the supernova remnant because uh, in the literature, it is shown that uh, the supernova remnant is related with a different cloud at a different uh, velocity range that corresponds to about 10 kiloparsecs uh, in distance. So that's why we uh, managed to uh, uh, figure out that uh, they are actually not uh, even belonging to the same, uh, same molecular cloud complex, let's say. Um, so the, count the contours here, uh, shown here are actually uh, TS contours, and normally uh, TS means test statistics. Um, and uh, in um, Fermilab analysis, we are do doing um, uh, uh, wind likelihood analysis normally for supernova remnants. And uh, test statistics is we are assuming that there is a uh, we are checking the likelihood uh, of uh, having a um, point source. Uh, versus not having a, a point source. And uh, from there, we are deriving this TS, and uh, meaning that uh, when you have, for example, a TS of 25, it means that uh, 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 about the square root of this TS is going to give you the significance of the signal. And therefore, uh, these uh, outer contours are starting already uh, by five sigma. And it is actually a very strong gamma ray emission at the center. But what's so striking here with this one is that uh, this uh, center or the most significant part uh, of this uh, source, this gamma ray source, is coinciding uh, with this uh, emission uh, coming from this cloud, uh, arc-like shape actually, uh, as a matter of fact. And uh, it is quite interviewing. Uh, we just suggested that this might be related to a star formation uh, region or uh, maybe uh, other types of objects, like, uh, for example, uh, winds uh, or star winds that may create um, uh, some uh, gamma rays. Uh, we, of course, speculated, but we don't know exactly what it is, but it's definitely uh, not related the question, to the supernova yeah. remnant. Yes. Uh, uh, what is the resolution uh, of the gamma ray image uh, that you see here? I mean, is it uh, good enough that you can actually associate the curvature of the contour? Uh, uh, we the... actually uh, calculated the best fitting position, and uh, the best fitting position's error bars uh, are the localization errors, uh, which are around 0 0.5. Uh, this is the max, I'm saying, because I cannot remember the exact uh, error statistical error sure. right now, it was about 0 0.5 degrees. Um, this ah. is uh, the localization error uh, of this uh, this object. As you key, can see, um, gamma ray sources um, are not, it's not like in X-rays, you will not be able to have very sharp, uh, sharp, good angular resolution uh, images, unfortunately. That's why source confusion is a big problem, and that's why uh, we need uh, multi-wavelength observation and all sorts of different tools uh, to be able to disentangle uh, these sources from each other. Okay. 
so so the fact that the contour sort of goes around the um, radio um, uh, the uh, arc uh, shape there mm -hmm, could be mm -hmm. just uh, coincidental oh yeah uh, it can be that that's right of course yeah. okay. if you might need more data actually to be able to justify that uh, they have a, a physical um, relationship okay. we are only seeing that they are spatially co uh, coinciding uh, so another aspect of uh, multivabeling observations is that they may help to increase the number of supernova remnants uh, that we see in gamma rays. Uh, so the existing uh, number of galactic supernova remnants plus PVN, as I mentioned before, was about 60. Uh, in comparison to radio SNRs, which are around 300. So, and also radio SNRs are expected, to, the number of them are expected to increase uh, with new radio observations to 1,500 to 3,000, that's a huge number. So if you look uh, for new multivalent observations, for example, in radio, and if you check with uh, Fermilat, uh, Fermilat observations, these locations, maybe we will be able to uh, come up uh, with new uh, gamma ray SNRs. Uh, here, for example, uh, you see uh, an observation. This is a significance map from HES, by the way. Uh, so um, the color is indicating the more brighter the color gets, the more significance you will, you will have. Uh, initially, uh, this map was taken only to observe this well-known uh, supernova remnant W41. But as they did these observations, they also find some excess gamma ray emission at this location. Uh, initially, there was no supernova remnant at this location. But later on, uh, there was a radio survey for supernova remnants called GLEAM. And uh, in this survey, they found out that uh, in radio, that there is actually a radio supernova remnant here. And therefore, uh, now uh, it, it looks as if uh, there is, again, a spatial coincidence between the supernova remnant uh, in, found in radio uh, with TV and on top of it, the GEV uh, contours, which are white ones and black ones are TV contours. So um, this is very uh, useful. Alternatively, multivalent observations can be performed at the locations of unidentified gamma ray sources uh, to reveal whether they are supernova remnants or not. OK, uh, so far, so good. And now uh, we switch to machine learning tools. Why do we need to use machine learning tools? Uh, machine learning tools are used to quickly and efficiently recognize a certain source type or class, like SNRs, among all source classes in a freshly observed gamma ray data set, and to classify these objects into subcategories. It's also used to generate uh, artificial uh, samples, as well as to understand the governing dynamics uh, of uh, a certain system. Uh, so I will start with some uh, previous, uh, previously studied relevant supernova remnant analysis using these uh, machine learning tools. In this study, uh, for example, uh, uh, image processing was used to detect circular objects. Uh, on the graph here at the top, a part of galactic plane was simulated uh, in TEV gamma rays for, uh, for the HESS observatory. But you see here in the middle uh, graph is the corresponding gradient map, which tells uh, the strong edge transitions. <clears throat> then Kenny edge detector is employed to find true edges uh, by suppressing uh, superfluous ones. And finally, they run the uh, half transform on these edges to detect uh, circular uh, objects which have closed form mathematical representations. And they come up with this. Of course, they trained, uh, trained these uh, methods. Uh, that's why, actually, uh, we say that this is a machine learning uh, tool. Now, let me discuss the disadvantages. Oh, so, of sorry, can, can, can you say sure. what they trained it on? Uh, what, so what, oh, what well. did they do exactly? Uh, in this detect, uh, in this, uh, they used actually the initially the simulated uh, uh, simulated supernova remnant uh, images here uh, mm -hmm. to uh, find out the edges here uh, with the Kenny edge detector, and mm -hmm. they actually removed uh, the excess uh, uh, here with this Kenny edge detector, um, and the noise sort of is removed. And after that, uh, they run a half transform on these edges uh, to detect uh, circular objects. Uh, here, um, which so which, which you, part is the um, training? Uh, the, the training is using these uh, circular objects uh, to detect 
uh, these, uh, I mean, sorry, to detect these circular uh, parts here. That's the uh, training part here. But they seem to still find uh, excess uh, circles in the last, in the lowest panel. Yeah, so what they did is uh, they detected shell-like, disc-like, or Gaussian-like, or point-like uh, mm -hmm. sources. So, uh, for example, in the uh, lowest uh, panel here, you see, for example, here is a uh, closed form, like a circle, but it's actually intersecting with another um, uh, shape. So, um, therefore, they have to uh, classify them accordingly uh, if it is a, uh, if it's really like a Gaussian shape, or is it a disk or shell, which is in, in intersecting with each, uh, two shells, for example, intersecting with each other. Or here you can also find an intersection, intersecting uh, shell, for example. And uh, there are some, uh, some of them are point-like. Uh, more, uh, more no, point. But, but, okay, so that is the part that is actually confusing me. So the that uh, that uh, yep. thing that you mentioned uh, last, uh, you know, uh, there is no correspondence in the real data, right? Mm -hmm. So what yeah, is unfortunately, there is no. Uh, yes, uh, these are all uh, derived from a simulated uh, gamma ray uh, emission. So right. they actually simulated, uh, for example, uh, some different shape SNRs. Some of them are. Uh, uh, shell-like, and some of them are um, location, uh, positionally intersecting each other, etc. And uh, they tried to then, after all this um, clearing out uh, of the noise, uh, they tried to understand uh, if the shapes remaining are um, sh circular-like, okay. or if they have any, you know, uh, intersections with each other, or they are more like point-like or not. Uh, so this is uh, then what they tried to classify, let's say, uh, after uh, they ended up, uh, after they completed. Right. Uh, but why this, is uh, there uh, anything at all if they know that there is no source? Uh, I guess they want to use them uh, for uh, future observations. They want no, to use this, this, is, this is the one that I'm uh, talking about, right? I mean, there, is, mm -hmm. there isn't anything here. Uh, yes. <laughs> Let, uh, yeah, for example, that's noise completely. There is no uh, right. data there. Right. Uh, that, uh, why? That's the question. Uh, so the, the, if you ask that, that is because of this, uh, uh, because they are running this uh, half transform on these edges of these um, super, so to say, supernova remnants uh, to uh, trying to, un uh, tr trying to detect these uh, circular objects. Uh, which have a closed form. They are only concentrating on uh, circular objects because they are uh, assuming that uh, most of the supernova remnants uh, seen in uh, in uh, gamma rays are in showing this kind of form, which is actually not the reality, uh, because we don't always see uh, supernova in, in, even in gamma rays. We don't see them always in, in circular shape. Uh, we sometimes see, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, these mixed morphology supernova remnants uh, look quite different. For example, at their interaction sites, you see a point-like gamma ray emission. You do not see a um, distinct morphology as a matter of fact. Um, so that's why uh, this method has some disadvantages, actually, okay. uh, which, okay. uh, uh, which I will mention uh, to you now. Uh, first, okay. it's not okay. possible. Right. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, yep, no problem. <laughs> uh, first of all, it is not possible to detect regions with complex geometric shapes. Uh, even they, even if they use the generalized half transform, they should have generated an R table for all different types of complex objects, uh, which is actually a very tedious task because you have to then uh, have an R table, which is a map, one by one map of every single. Uh, supernova remnants, and every remnant has a different morphology, actually. So it cannot be used to recognize all supernova remnant types uh, because uh, the type, depending on the type of the supernova remnant, they will have different morphologies. So it is failing, uh, this method methodology is failing uh, in these um, aspects. Now I would like to continue with another study, which uh, clusters spatial beans of Chandra data. Uh, although uh, variation autoencoders' true purpose is to estimate an unknown probability distribution over the input data, uh, in the study, authors employ it to find a compressed representation. 
of the data. Uh, by doing so, they uh, reduce uh, they reduce it, uh, the chance to be affected by the phenomenon called the curse of dimensionality. Um, so, uh, doing this, uh, applying this method, they reduced the 37 dimensional bin representation into uh, a four dimensional uh, bin representation. And lastly, uh, they, uh, they feed this lower dimensional representation uh, into a, a Gaussian a mixture model to do a soft clustering over the bins. And so in this plot here, uh, you see eight predefined clusters uh, and they display each significant feature which corresponding here to these, um, each of these axes versus uh, the other axes. Uh, so, uh, the, of course, this method also has some disadvantages. Uh, first off, uh, they treat each bin as an individual entity. Thus, uh, they cannot uh, actually figure out the correlation between the neighboring bins. So, because uh, so the variation autoencoder does not get this information of uh, the neighboring bins uh, because it's taking into uh, the uh, every single uh, bin as an individual entity. Secondly, due to the same reasoning, it's not possible to capture multi-scale features. If they used a multi-scale model, uh, for example, um, CNN convolutional neural networks, they would be able to capture a, a particular local feature at a particular uh, spatial resolution, even if, at, if it would not be visible uh, in the original resolution. Finally, it seems like uh, this in this study, they do not need variational autoencoders uh, to do this dim uh, dimensionality reduction because they have omitted the decoder part uh, of uh, the encoder uh, variational autoencoder, thus they could use actually uh, instead principal component analysis instead, uh, which is simpler method. Now, last one uh, is uh, is this I, here. I, I just ask, are you saying that you think that PCA would for some reason uh, capture more relevant dimensions of the data? Uh, or your no, uh, I'm just saying that PCA would just do uh, do this type of analysis, uh, uh, just like what they did with the variation autoencoder. PCA well, would do the same job. No, uh, it won't. It will also give you a. It will. It will give you mm -hmm. a different mm -hmm. low dimensional representation, not the same low dimensional representation, right? Hmm. Okay. Unless it's just PCA again. So the question is, which of those representations is more likely, or do you have some, or do, is there some reason to think that one or the other of those representations will be more relevant for your ultimate classification? It could be that the, uh, I have to check the paper, but I guess they used, or here what they show is only these uh, eight, eight representations. Uh, so uh, these uh, in terms of clusters, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, um, it could be, uh, uh, yes, for the and for their analysis to be able to interpret this data, I think it would be, uh, maybe it's more relevant. And what I understood here is that these uh, pre uh, predefined clusters are rather uh, the uh, energy, uh, different uh, energy bins, uh, because uh, the um, spatial distribution uh, of a supernova remnant is changing uh, according to the, uh, in which energy you are looking at this uh, uh, these objects. So uh, therefore, uh, it, it depends on uh, which energy bins are more relevant uh, for uh, your uh, interpretation uh, of this data. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, I think I actually finished this slide, so we can go to the next uh, uh, research that I want to share. This here is the last one. And uh, this is actually the most relevant one uh, to my own research plan because they conduct a binary classification uh, to recognize supernova remnants in the noisy background. So in this figure, for example, uh, you see a, a typical SNR. Uh, we observe such as, of course, this is um, not, uh, this is a typical shell type SNR. Uh, let's be more specific. And uh, this image here uh, is a, just a non uh, SNR sample. Uh, used in this study. And they apply different types of machine learning uh, methods uh, here listed here uh, to see which one is performing uh, this task better. And the challenging task for uh, random forest is to decide 
how uh, to split a tree uh, via maximum information gain. They use a Gini index for this purpose. Uh, and they also use the support vector machine to learn a separation, uh, separation hypersurface in the future space uh, between a supernova remnant and uh, the background source. Uh, however, uh, they obtain the best results uh, with the convolutional neural network, uh, which I will show you uh, as next. Uh, here uh, on the top, uh, this is their study, but from their study, uh, here on the top you see, uh, you see their CNN architecture. Uh, these are the layers in the architecture. And uh, after each layer, they reduce the resolution via max pooling. They learn features at different scale levels. So uh, these are the uh, nonlinear uh, features uh, obtained uh, from each layer. Uh, and uh, these are nonlinear because convolution output is passed through a nonlinear function. Uh, for example, it could be a, a rectified linear unit or it could be a sigmoid uh, function, a hyperbolic tangent, etc., etc., and they fit these nonlinear features uh, in a uh, fully connected neural, neural network uh, to do a binary classification, uh, and they either choose SNR or non-SNR object. Uh, due, to, due to the lack of observed samples, because they really have a very limited number of samples, uh, they augmented their training data set uh, by applying linear transformations uh, to the existing whatever they had uh, in their hands. So, uh, for example, they use the rotation scaling translation to the uh, existing samples uh, to increase uh, the number of samples. Wait, no, the, uh, 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 sure. Sorry, that Go part ahead. really confused me. Uh, is the data augmentations done? They create additional samples from the existing samples? Exactly. Like the, and these, exi these existing samples are being used for the training as well? Mm, yes. <laughs> so, I mean, I understand the data augmentation often is used to, to as bring additional information, like, uh, you know, priors, all those things. Like, but this sounds like uh, you're just creating more data out of nowhere. I mean, where, where's the information coming from? Where, where, where is the... Uh, uh, the information is just a uh, known data samples. Uh, I think they were X-ray data. Uh, this is the images of uh, SNRs taken in X-rays. I think they were X-ray data. Um, and they used this kind of translations like a rotation scale. They just rotated, uh, scaled, and translated the images to create more samples. Right, uh, right. I understand that. But that that sounds like you just need a one, one thing. I can create many, many samples. So we're... Where, where is this, uh, what's the real information here, right? I can take any one data set to also translations, then say, okay, I have more samples, but that's not, unless these translations, I, mean, I, I see a point of sometimes the translation say, this thing should be invariant to translate to, to rotations, right? So that kind of creates a little bit more information, which is legit. But otherwise you're, you're essentially like, uh, you're doubling or tripling your data set. You certainly will affect your, error rate, right? I mean, no, the uh, error bound, because you're creating a lot more than you actually need. I try to understand a little bit of what is the, uh, why, why, why it's legit to do that. Uh, I, actually, I wanted to just talk about the disadvantages in, uh, in, in the same line okay. of okay. this paper. Now here, uh, this is the disadvantages I uh, think uh, there are uh, here of this method. Uh, first of all, um, Authors do not mention whether uh, their learned, learned features are relevant to the morphology of the SNRs. They only okay. said uh, it's uh, like it's SNR or not, uh, but we don't know uh, if the SNRs uh, are Gaussian-like SNRs in shape, for example, or they are disk-like uh, or uh, any other morphologies. Uh, another disadvantage is that all multiple perceptron-based models, such as convolutional neural network and fully connected neural networks, require to, uh, to, too many samples. Uh, typically 100,000 and even millions to do accurate feature extraction and classification. And so uh, this way, uh, what they produced are not sufficient actually uh, to be able to do accurate uh, extraction and classification. And finally, their data augmenta augmentation method is not uh, sufficient to resolve this issue. And uh, in, actually in our um, following slides, we would like to address this uh, problem properly. 
Okay. Uh, so okay. let me uh, go to the uh, now <laughs> quickly. I, I'm going to mention about my research plan uh, for the next two years at least. Uh, so my research plan was proposed as a Horizon 2020 project uh, last year. And I received a score of 79.6 passing the scientific evaluation threshold, but I could not pass the second threshold uh, to be financed. So I would like to pursue this research plan and complete it within the next one to two years. And my collaborators here in this project are Ilker Gurjan and Ulusan Anguner. Um, and any future collaborators are, of course, welcome here. And let me now show you uh, this uh, framework, uh, which is the general framework for, stat uh, for statistical inference. Uh, we, uh, we pick a sample from this population and send it to our statistical toolbox along with our assumptions, uh, such as IDD and so on. Our main concern here lies on the estimation uh, of uh, this uh, P. Um, so we, we would like to find the posterior distribution uh, over our parameter space, uh, theta. Uh, so then we will compute the marginal uh, likelihood, uh, p uh, x given d, and, and uh, make some inference about the population. Um, so uh, there are two main co uh, components in our uh, proposed model. Uh, which, uh, which is, uh, the first one is here on the left side of this uh, dashed uh, line, uh, is uh, showing you uh, the sampling. Uh, it's uh, sampling artificial SNRs uh, from a learned distribution over the training samples. And the second one is using uh, this, this part here. Uh, the second one is using these samples uh, to train a classifier uh, over here. So uh, now I will talk about the generative model, uh, which is the normalizing flow. Um, a normalizing flow is based on two ingredients. Uh, base distribution, Q of Z, it typically is a normal distribution, uh, and a series of uh, bijective transformations. Uh, at each uh, time step, we apply an infinitesimal bijective transformation to obtain uh, an intermediary uh, distribution, P. Uh, sub t of z, and finally uh, we reach uh, our uh, base distribution. And the composition of these bijective transformations is, uh, is of course invertible. So uh, sampling from uh, the source distribution, uh, q of z, becomes the same as uh, sampling uh, from target distribution, p of x, and the goal is to maximize the log likelihood uh, based on the change of variables uh, given um, here, as I shown here, uh, um, so uh, given in the middle of this uh, figure, uh, so this J in the denominator uh, is uh, representing the Jacobian of the composite transformation uh, up to time t. Um, okay, here I summarize how we prepare training data for the normalizing flow. And uh, usually we use uh, existing uh, supernova remnants or other source classes from existing GVT, the gamma ray catalogs, uh, and we simulate large number of gamma ray sources using simulation tools uh, developed by CTA collaboration. And this is the uh, name of this tool. And this shows here uh, what a typical supernova remnant, how a typical supernova remnant uh, is simulated. And here you see the same supernova remnant, but with different uh, parameters uh, of the uh, co cosmic ray parameters, let's say, or the environment parameters are changed and simulated again. Uh, once we train the normalizing flow, we obtain an approximation uh, for our target distribution P of X. Uh, first, we sample uh, from normal distribution. And then uh, we use the inverse transformation that we learn uh, to generate SNRs and non-SNR samples in thousands and millions, actually. So uh, then now let me continue with the classification phase, which is the second phase. Uh, now we have here labeled data. Uh, this is the labeled data, which is uh, passed uh, to this uh, feature extraction algorithm. And you would like to use uh, here, uh, we are planning actually to use uh, convolutional neural network based uh, feature extractors. And so this extraction process is going to yield uh, various characteristics uh, of an SNR, uh, which are uh, which could be, for example, spatial features as shown here, or they could be some 
uh, spectral features. And then once we have these two, uh, we can combine them to have a single uh, feature. And then once we have that, uh, we use a classifier uh, to discern uh, supernova remnants from non-supernova remnants, um, as, uh, as shown uh, here uh, in this uh, little graph, uh, actually. Uh, so for uh, a classifier, we either want to use a spurt uh, vector machine or uh, we can use a fully connected net, uh, network uh, for this purpose and do the classification. Uh, and then as a result in this illustration, as you see, there is a hyperplane uh, that's separating the supernova here uh, from the non-supernova uh, objects. Uh, in this way, uh, we will uh, finish our analysis and the advantages of this method are uh, <clears throat> as follows, uh, the most common problem across all statistical learning tools is hunger for data and generalization to unseen samples is uh, very challenging. Uh, it's even harder when you have a li limited size of data, uh, like this is the case as you have seen in previous studies uh, with the SNRs. And uh, by applying these methods, uh, it will lead us to, uh, to it, it would lead to detailed description of the substructures in complex regions uh, that would then ease the multi-wavelength association search for SNRs and also it will help firmly identify uh, the unidentified gamma ray sources. And that was the end of my talk and thank you very much for your attention. Hey, thank you, Tulu. Thank you. Uh -huh. and, uh, questions, comments? want to ask you about this normalizing flow idea because we actually heard a talk right Renee, we did we have the, the talk not too long ago I about this idea so, yeah uh yeah. from the physicist what's her name from Cor Corey, is it? Um, oh, yeah. the one from uh, uh from uh, toronto Valking. no 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 from 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 our department of uh, physics here the, Valking. Valking. right 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 uh, right, right, right oh a right. student that's right yes right, yes right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right, it's a, was a talk very early. In right, the I mean semester. it's a, I mean it's a very interesting idea, right? It's an interesting idea saying, if you have a complicated transformation, as long as you know the transformation, you can sample one, sample the other is entirely equivalent, right? Um, I want to ask you is what is your uh, experience working with that? Because I, I, we, I don't have experience with it. I, 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 I understand the methodology. I think it's an interesting, a very idea. It's very also related to the literature on this called of the uh, optimal transport. They're trying to transport very mm -hmm. from one to the other. Um, but I am a little bit of, well, not worried, but I want to know, you know, somehow lots of those things, just like MCMC, it's a simple idea to describe that but there's a lot of details in, you know, in the devil. And uh, uh, so have, have you tried like the numerical stability? How large is the T and, uh, uh, no, uh, you know, not yet, uh, okay. not yet. Uh, okay. And, uh, as I said, I have the col my collaborators working on this issue, uh, with me, and we are hoping to, uh, actually start this project. Uh, we, we haven't started yet, uh, to implement, uh, this, these methodologies. It's uh, still in the, uh, construction phase, okay. uh, as you see, all these are ideas, but, uh, eventually, uh, I'm looking for an opportunity, uh, to start this uh, project as soon as possible so that we can also have an experience, uh, in this. Mm -hmm. That you know, that be terrific. I have one suggestion. If you're going to start doing those sure, things, sure. is the uh, because you know people for this group, uh, we are much more familiar with doing Michael Chimaldi Carlo that kind of thing. And for a lot of these yes. problems, you can also try MCMC, right? You you, yeah. you I mean you, you you try Metropolis some some version. I would love to see in your this view application if you can also implement some MCMC to make a comparison. So okay, to to mm -hmm. give us a sense in terms of the uh, accuracy, the computation efficiency, how easy it is. I think that, that would be a, a very important contribution to the kind of a methodological community because we will, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to be convinced because I, I, I think <laughs> theoretically this is actually a stronger one because you're basically do a transformation. If you do a, a nice transformation, it, it can entirely avoid this uh, diagnostic, you know, uh, thing about MCMC. But on the other hand, I know the devil is in this detail how you construct yes. this these approximations and uh, so this will be I think at least to me will methodologically to see these comparison will be very interesting. 
thank you very much for your comments and I agree with you completely. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, I'm very curious to see. Uh, I agree with you with the det uh, that the, um, you know, devil is in the details part, <laughs> especially. So I, uh, the problem is that I'm just currently working in, uh, in, uh, in an institute where I am uh, dedicated uh, my day job is actually not related to this but uh, <laughs> uh, I, so i need some time uh, to start this project so this is um, uh, how far i came with this uh, yes it's an idea but i would like to implement it uh, and i believe that uh, I, of course i only believe now uh, it needs convinc uh, convincing indeed Thank you. <laughs> we can definitely create a night job for you. You know, that's. Uh... I am working already. <laughs> I am working uh, in, during the day. Uh, when I come home after eating, I start working on these things, and yeah. in the weekend I'm working. So uh, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, but, please, uh, uh, if you have any, uh, if you like to contribute, uh, please uh, let us uh, know. Let me know. Uh, so I would be pleased, uh, of course, to know your ideas. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it'd be, I mean, this is definitely worth to, worth to exploring for, for us as a group. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. So, yes, um, I found this reference. So, this was uh, flow based likelihood for non Gaussian inference. And it's uh, exactly, that's exactly. Yeah, talk. it was yeah. uh, Ana Diaz Rivero. It was one of the first, our first talk in the uh, fall this year semester. Yeah. So, uh, it's still, year. I think it's still uh, on. Uh, the chat squeeze the link to this Astra page. So yes, to and you can, uh, to learn, you can go there and uh, you know on our our task website there is the mm -hmm. first talk which could be relevant. I will check. You were doing so they were they were talking about uh, uh, the method for cosmology uh, mm -hmm. application. Mm -hmm. So it's a, mm -hmm. a different application, but the methodology might be relevant. I will yeah, check and, it. Thank you. Right, and 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 they're they're local here, and they also have done they have done quite a bit. They I think have published multiple yeah. articles. They have implemented, so they're what they're the one mm -hmm. definitely have some real experience there. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so okay. to, to a quick question: So why do you think that this method will not have the problem, uh, especially of that uh, uh, you know the uh, false uh, sources that that the first method was picking up? Uh, yeah, which or, one? The first, second, third? Uh, uh, the first one that you the mentioned. Half you know, the one with the half transform, half -trans transform uh, the circles. I mean, just let me come. Yeah, that one. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, why, do you, why do you think that um, this new method won't have this, uh, won't run into this problem? Uh, first of all, uh, our aim currently uh, is not um, trying to discern uh, different uh, subclasses of a supernova remnants. Uh, this project is only addressing uh, if an object is um, a supernova or not a supernova. Um, uh, right? So um, that's why um, and this is one that this is uh, the first thing and the second thing is that uh, we will be able to produce many many more samples than just uh, uh, what these people created with these simulations which are uh, actually a limited sample of supernova remnants mm -hmm. uh, so our uh, model will be able to produce millions of different uh, shapes uh, morphological shapes uh, uh, based on uh, the simulations we will have the simulations still but it will be used uh, for uh, testing, um, sorry, uh, training, sorry, uh, mm -hmm. uh, this first part, our normalizing flow part. And after that, here, we will have millions of uh, different shapes uh, mm -hmm. in hand, and that will help us, help us uh, to differentiate uh, between uh, what is a supernova remnant or not. Uh, but maybe in the future, uh, we will be able to, once we see that this method is uh, successfully working and producing good results, uh, reliable uh, results, uh, then we can go and go to the second phase of this project and try uh, to uh, find the subclasses of, of supernova remnants. But okay. we are not aiming for it. And uh, uh, the, this, in this paper, uh, the, in the literature, they were trying to um, focus on the uh, spherical shape uh, or the circular shape, let's say, uh, of mm -hmm. these SNRs. In in our case, we do not have such a concern of uh, that the supernova remnants will have a certain ge uh, at a certain circular shape or a certain geometry. At at least for now, in this uh, 
part of the project. For future, maybe we will be more concerned about the exact morphologies of supernova remnants. Once you obtain uh, this part uh, here, uh, then mm -hmm. we can just go and um, go to the, sec the second uh, project, maybe go for a second project and uh, simply uh, try to figure out the differences between uh, or subclasses of these uh, supernova. Okay, uh, one follow-up question. Uh, that after the separation uh, curve that you have there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the um, figure D. Um, is, uh, is presumably, you know, um, the point where there is this changeover happens, uh, it could be fuzzy, right? So uh, essentially that would be an uncertainty uh, on that curve. Uh, is there a way to figure out, um, uh, to calculate that as part of the analysis? Or is it a sharp curve uh, with an infinite number of, uh, infinite precision? No, uh, no, I don't think that it will be a sharp uh, edge, but uh, I do not have the details of this, uh, so I will not be able to completely answer your question. Okay. So I have a question about the application. So in, in your mind, is this the application for the supernova in the gamma rays and TV detectors? So for the uh, CTA observations in the future, or it can be applied to other wavelengths as well. Uh, so uh, we planned this project for supernova remnants uh, in GEV and TEV uh, oh. gamma rays initially, but uh, once we see that this method, uh, and why, uh, let me say why, because actually I mentioned in the slides that we only have in the catalogs currently in total in GEV and TV gamma rays, uh, only 60 PV, uh, SNR and PVN. So it's really, really low. For example, if you comparison, compare this with the number of uh, SNRs uh, detected in radio currently, it's about 300 SNRs. So they have many more uh, SNRs. Still, it's very low, uh, as you, as you uh, may know, mm -hmm. uh, because people want, they, they are expecting to uh, see many, many more. So where are these uh, supernova remnants? And I believe that radio yeah. observatories are doing a quite good job uh, with uh, observing uh, currently the skies and uh, <clears throat> publishing uh, new uh, catalogs uh, of supernova remnants, which we follow, but we are coming a little uh, behind them, uh, sort of. And uh, also, uh, radio telescopes, uh, of course, depending on the radio telescope uh, array, uh, they have better angular resolution uh, in comparison to uh, gamma ray uh, telescopes. Yeah. And therefore, uh, we have really this source confusion problem, which they do not have. Um, but nevertheless, uh, once we see that this, um, these methods are working, uh, this machinery <laughs> is producing accurate uh, results, then we can actually maybe try to apply this to also radio uh, data, for example, because they also are collecting plenty of data. In fact, uh, there is the square kilometer array, uh, LOFAR, uh, which are producing mm -hmm. plenty of data, which uh, then in this case uh, could be also uh, used uh, for radio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about X-rays because uh, you know we are. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm an X-ray astronomer, so for, for me the X-rays. No, I know, are... I know. <laughs> <laughs> the primary and also, uh, Athena is going to produce yeah. uh, uh, lots yeah, of it's... information. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, there is actually Erosita, which is uh, oh, yeah. mapping the sky, and uh, mm -hmm. you will have the huge uh, data uh, mm -hmm. of the whole sky, and there could be supernovae, you know, X-ray supernovae in this database. I mean, there will be a lot of sources. Um, Indeed. You know, because Chandra, Chandra does just point, uh, pointing observation, but uh, Erosita is all sky survey, so... Uh, it doesn't have as good resolution as Chandra, but you know it has uh, a potential to detect supernovae, and uh, you know that definitely. Uh, Actually, it's I, found uh, at least two supernovae that were uh, remnants that were too big for Chandra to ever observe. Hmm. For example, right. yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, too big to you know Chandra field of view is just uh, sixteen yeah. second arc minutes. Sorry. So what small. comes up my mind uh, regarding Erosita is here, um, 
I'm just guessing. I don't know, but the, do they have a simulation tool? Uh, just like here, what I mentioned with CTA, for example, we are able to ma uh, make some uh, simulations of supernova remnants, uh, which we can use for uh, training samples uh, to, mm -hmm. to produce samples. So that would be maybe, uh, yeah, that in this yeah, case, you have yeah, to... They I mean, actually, if you have, yeah, you have the simulations definitely to, to yes. do this. I don't know the uh -huh. Erosita uh, software and system because the data is still not public and it's all yeah, uh, owned by, you know, German uh, uh, team or the mm -hmm. um, Russian team. So this data will become public eventually, but not now, uh, right? So, yeah. So what uh, we yeah, see and is it's also what not is public. released, right? Uh, it's also not public, right? No, not yet. And eventually, so, yeah, eventually it will become when they finish the survey and the data, mm -hmm. you know, are processed, then, then they become public maybe in a few years. But I don't I know see. exactly when. Mm -hmm. I see. But by yeah, then, so, you uh, have the methods develop, right? I mean, that's the, <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's like... Um, well, I'm like, hoping, uh, I am hoping uh, really to... Um, Get my get my hands on this as soon as possible uh, to you know uh, try to see the first results uh, of it, and then as you said we can implement it anywhere uh, because this part here is really uh, the simulations uh, for gamma rays, but it could be replaced if pos if there are any tools in X rays or radio for such simulations. Uh, then well, why not? Then it, the rest of this um, uh, the rest of this analysis can be implemented to other wavelengths. Uh, uh, only uh, part here is with this uh, sampling, uh, the training data for the normalizing flow parts. So, uh, but, yeah, okay. and also public data is another issue, as you mentioned. Uh, CTA is more or less in this same category. Uh, the first year data will probably not be available to the public but after that uh, they will be able to they it is going to be a public observatory it will be open always uh, uh, to everybody just like Fermilat so this is especially very very good uh, and once you trained this normalizing flow uh, then uh, anytime when you have fresh data coming in uh, from CTA let's say then you can just uh, throw it in and if it's a sky survey data type of thing for example where you want to find immediate answers uh, to know you know quick classification let's say uh, is it snr or not then uh, this would be a very nice tool to use um, uh, that will give you uh, initial quick initial results uh, mm -hmm. sort of so uh, in a sense uh, um, you know when you have a weak snr it's um, is, um, this is practically a tool for detecting uh, extended sources, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be SNRs per se. And what make right? I mean, there's is there anything yes. that specifically makes it an SNR detection tool as opposed to an extended source detection? Uh, yes, there. Yeah, <laughs> there are certain issues with this, which I mentioned already in my talk. That uh, yes, extension is. Uh, very typical for SNRs, but uh, the morphology uh, may differ. So uh, you can have a shell type SNR in gamma rays, or you might have something that is more centralized, like a Gaussian shape, or it could be more a disk like. Uh, however, there are other sources which uh, look like that as well. Um, for example, there are many unidentified sources which we don't know what they are. They might be, for example, combination of couple of point like gamma ray sources which are very close to each other and because of the bad angle resolution of the observatory, uh, maybe they will look like as if they are some, uh, they have some, they are a single source with a certain extension and they may look like uh, SNRs. Uh, okay, so uh, in this sense, uh, we will, we should be able to, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> figure out uh, how to deal with these kind of uh, contamination problems uh, because we didn't test this tool we don't know how successful it will be okay. uh, but having so many different uh, types of um, uh, I mean millions of uh, samples uh, will uh, help us definitely uh, with uh, a better classification I believe uh, at least and uh, not only that, uh, you can actually run this tool over the unidentified sources uh, in gamma rays, and then it should be able to tell you 
uh, how many of these unidentified sources uh, will be supernova remnants and how many not. Of course, there will be certain contamination, surely. Uh, but remember that uh, this, the, the data that we want to feed in, the real data, I mean, will be CTA data, which will have much better angular resolution than the current um, telescopes. Of course, it will not be like uh, X-rays or um, X-rays or radio data. It will still not be as accurate in angular resolution as, as those uh, instruments. But still, it is, uh, I think, in gamma rays, uh, it will uh, do a very good job, especially at higher energies. Uh, let's say at higher TV yeah. energies. Yeah. Thomas has his hand up. Can I? Can I <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a couple comments. Yeah, but first thing. Because are we gonna are we gonna have a, a, oh. a yeah we should yeah we oh should yeah okay a so uh, Sorry. Should, yes um, let's do that uh, good 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 uh, good point uh, David so uh, I guess we should uh, stop recording now and say uh, thank you uh, thank you Tulum for a very nice talk uh, sure. and also thank the um, uh, the uh, the audience uh, excuse them so to speak. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so we'll just have David, Jaoni, and Thomas online.